All right, well, it's good to be with you this morning and to be able to uh, share from the book of Joshua, and uh, we're going to get to that in a moment, but first I want to ask you a question, which is, have you ever felt like it's up to you to save the world? Have you ever felt like it's up to you to save the world? This is a great theme in literature. It's the theme of a lot of books. It's the theme of of movies. It's the theme of of TV shows. Uh, We see it in all kinds of things. Um, Some of you perhaps may be familiar with the show 24, Jack Bauer. Uh, This is a little bit of a dated reference now, but Jack Bauer, who has to save the world. Um, He specifically has to save Los Angeles from being destroyed by a nuclear bomb that's been planted uh, by terrorists. Some of you may be familiar with Sherlock Holmes and John Watson. Oops, went a little bit too far ahead there. Who uh, also have to save the world from not only a a bomb that's been planted under the parliament houses in Britain, uh, but from all kinds of uh, nefarious villains and dastardly masterminds. Um, My wife and I uh, recently have, have watched some more of this series, and it seems like every villain that they encounter is a little bit more dastardly than the last. Um, And, of course, this is the theme of most uh, superhero comics and movies, right? That there's a a superhero and he, usually it's a he, sometimes it's Wonder Woman or Batgirl or somebody like that, has to save the world. They have to stop this villain uh, with the secret lair before it's too late. Or perhaps one of my favorite, uh, perhaps one of your favorites as well, Frodo, the unassuming hobbit in the Shire, has to take the ring of power to Mount Doom and destroy it in the fires there in order to overthrow the power of Sauron and prevent him from covering all the lands in the second darkness. Um, Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. Now, probably nobody here has had to destroy a ring of power or defuse a nuclear bomb or foil the plans of a nefarious villain with a secret lair. Although, if you have done any of those things, I would very much like to hear the story after the service. But sometimes we do feel that kind of pressure, don't we? We feel like it is up to us to save the world. It's up to us to prevent some kind of terrible thing from happening or to make sure that some very good thing happens. Um, I sometimes catch myself feeling this way, catch myself feeling as if the uh, fate of the world really rested on my shoulders. Um, And these are some of the kinds of things that go through my mind. And maybe things like this have gone through your mind as well. Not out loud. They sound almost a little bit silly if you say them out loud. But perhaps you've had, on some deep level, these kinds of thoughts. For example, if we plan carefully enough and read the right books and say the right things and use the right kinds of timeouts, our kids are going to grow up to follow Jesus and change the world for him. And if we don't do those things right, You know, some pretty bad things might happen. Or perhaps you thought, if I just convinced a few more people to volunteer for this thing at church, we'd really be able to do great things for the kingdom. Or, at work, if we all work a little bit harder and a little bit smarter, this organization or this ministry or this business is really going to overcome its current challenges and have a big impact for good in the world. Or if I can just find the right words to say, my coworker or my friend or my family member, this time they're going to hear the gospel and they're going to accept it and they're going to follow Jesus. It's a big responsibility. Or perhaps a little bit less seriously, if I could just post the right things on my Facebook account or my Twitter account or my Instagram account or whatever other account I have, and if I can wade into the comments with just the right arguments and the right jokes, people are going to see that Christianity really makes sense, and it's going to change some people's hearts and minds. Or, in my case, if I can just write one more article or teach one more class or join one more committee or whatever it is, I'd be doing my part to save the world somehow. Now, again, we rarely put it that way out loud, and when we say it out loud, it it almost sounds a little bit uh, silly. And maybe your set of issues are a little bit different. Maybe there's other things that weigh on your shoulders that are are like those things that I mentioned. But whatever the specifics are, if you're honest with yourself, thoughts like that, they kind of 
get your heart pumping a little faster. They get your blood pressure a little bit higher. Uh, Sometimes they crowd the peace and the rest out of your life. Sometimes they crowd the Sabbath out of your life and they leave you feeling drained. They leave you feeling overwhelmed. And sometimes the odds seem stacked so high against us that we just want to give up. We just want to say, really, there's nothing I can do other maybe than lie awake at night and toss and turn about this, but, but there's just no way I'm going to be able to overcome these odds. The point is, we all have battles to fight, and some of them, some of the things I mentioned maybe don't sound so serious, but some of them really are serious battles. They really are serious challenges, and a lot does depend on what we do. And in the passage that we're looking at today from the book of Joshua, we're going to get to see God's perspective on this kind of thing when we're facing these sorts of challenges and when we feel this sort of responsibility. So let's uh, turn to the book of John, uh, the book of Joshua. If you're not there already, uh, it's on page 337 uh, in the Pew Bibles. This morning we're looking sort of at the last part of chapter 5 and the first part of chapter 6, which is all uh, kind of one account. So that's page 337 in the Pew Bibles, Joshua chapter 5, starting at verse 13. And uh, thanks to the lovely young lady who read a portion of this for us. Uh, That is my wife, by the way. (laughs) I feel like I said that last time I preached, oh dear. Okay, so uh, Joshua chapter 5, verse 13. Um, So so I'm going to read this through, then we're going to unpack it a bit. So uh, starting at verse 13. Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Now Jericho was tightly shut up because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing their trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, Have all the people give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the people will go up, every man straight in. So Joshua, son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and have seven priests carry trumpets in front of it. And he ordered the people, Advance, march around the city with the armed guard going ahead of the Ark of the Lord. Okay, so let's, uh, let's look at the context of this passage. What is going on before this passage that we come to? If Joshua was thinking back on everything that had happened sort of leading up to this, what would be the sorts of things that he would remember? Well, he'd remember that more than 40 years ago, God delivered the Israelites out of Egypt through the Exodus. Uh, he led them across the Red Sea and into the wilderness. They wandered in the wilderness for f- about 40 years. And their destination, of course, was the land of Canaan, the promised land. This was the land that God had promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Who lived there? Well, uh, the people who lived there, and sometimes the Bible calls them Canaanites, sometimes it calls them Amorites, sometimes it gives a a list of of names of different peoples. Uh, But the one thing that we do know about them is that they were greatly depraved. These were messed up people. They worshipped detestable false gods, Uh, And they served them by doing horrible things. Uh, For example, religious prostitution, witchcraft, consulting the dead through mediums. Uh, They even, uh, most heinous of all, sacrificed their small children to their gods. There's ample historical evidence from Greek and Roman writers that the Phoenicians, uh, who were descended from some of the inhabitants of Canaan, would sacrifice their young children, their infants, by burning them alive in fire. Uh, We even uh, find in archaeological evidence that the cities in Canaan and the cities founded by the Phoenicians, including the great city of Carthage, uh, 
had uh, mass graves filled with the charred bones of infants. Now, back in the time of Abraham, God had told Abraham that the sin of the people of Canaan had not yet reached its full measure, but that 400 years later, it would reach its full measure, and then God would come and drive them out and uh, give the land to Abraham's descendants. Well, that is the, the time that has now come in this passage. It is now the time that God is executing his judgment on the Canaanites, uh, and he's going to reclaim the land for his people, the people who are going to serve him and not practice the kinds of, of detestable practices of the Canaanites. Now, as the Israelites approach the, the promised land, this is now the recent past for Joshua, uh, God had uh, said to Moses, appoint Joshua as your successor, And so Moses appointed Joshua as the person who would follow him as the leader of the Israelites. Uh, Shortly after that, Moses died and was buried by God. And now, under Joshua's leadership, the conquest of the promised land is beginning. The Israelites have very recently crossed the Jordan River, which God had stopped up, allowing them to uh, cross on dry ground, just like they crossed the Red Sea on dry ground. The Israelites had camped at a place called Gilgal. We don't know exactly where Gilgal was, but it's somewhere in the Jordan Valley near Jericho. Uh, And at Gilgal, all of the men were circumcised because that generation of men had not been circumcised. So they were all circumcised as a way of recommitting themselves to the covenant with the Lord. And they celebrated the Passover for the first time in a long time. And the first time in the land, in the promised land, they celebrated the Passover. That very day that they ate the Passover, the manna stopped, right? The manna, which was the bread that was coming down from from heaven that was feeding the Israelites, that had ended. And what this meant is there was no turning back. There was no, okay, we'll cross the Jordan River going the other way, go back into the wilderness and eat manna for a while. No, the manna was done. The time of wandering in the wilderness was done. They'd crossed the Jordan. They were now in the promised land. And so now Joshua and the Israelites were facing their first major obstacle in the promised land, their first real task, their first real challenge, and that was the fortified city of Jericho. This is a picture of uh, the Jordan Valley today in the region of Jericho. Uh, It's a a broad valley with uh, hilly, almost mountainous country uh, on both sides. And so that's the, the kind of visual setting for the passage that we're looking at this morning. Okay, so that's the context. Let's uh, go back to the text here. Look at verse 13 of chapter 5. It says, Joshua was near Jericho. It doesn't say what he was doing exactly. But from what happens in the remainder of the passage, it seems that he was by himself. So he's gone some distance from the Israelite camp. He's near Jericho. Um... Perhaps he was scouting out the approaches to Jericho. Perhaps he'd climbed up on a, on a hill and was getting a look towards the city. Uh, perhaps he just needed some time alone to think. And the Bible doesn't tell us exactly what was going through his mind, but it's reasonable to imagine that his thoughts were very much focused on this obstacle. We're focused on Jericho. What are we going to do about Jericho? Jericho was a walled city, as most cities were in those days, Uh, It was up on a hill on the west side of the Jordan Valley. And as far as we can tell, it was actually one of the oldest human settlements in existence. Uh, It's one of the oldest um, things that archaeologists have ever dug up, uh, is this uh, settlement of Jericho. It was already, at the time of Joshua, thousands of years old. And this is more than 3,000 years ago. It's about uh, three three and a half millennia ago. It was already thousands of years old at that point. It was also very well fortified. Those were thick walls. Archaeologists have found at the likely site of Jericho walls that are about one and a half meters or about five feet thick. Uh, Very, very uh, solid stone walls. And Jericho was also situated in a good spot. It was overlooking this fertile valley around the Jordan. Even today, as you can see, even though that's a very dry part of the world, uh, it was uh, very green. It was a place where you could grow things. Today, there's a lot of date palms that are grown in that area. The city also had natural springs that came down from the hills that fed it with groundwater. So it was a city that could be shut up 
uh, under a siege for quite a long time because they would have water, they would have provisions stored up. In short, this was a very old, very strong, well-fortified, well-fed city sitting right in the path of the Israelites uh, who were going to be going up into the hill country of Canaan. Now, Joshua and the Israelites had encountered obstacles before, most recently the Jordan River. Um, But this new obstacle of Jericho was significant because it was the first piece of the promised land they had to conquer. Okay, so they have this task of conquest. This was the first thing that they had to conquer. And again, we don't know exactly what Joshua was thinking. But if it had been me, I would have been feeling some pressure, right? I would have been feeling the weight of that responsibility. This is my first battle. It's going to be a decisive battle. It's going to set the tone for the rest of our time in the promised land. I'm Moses' successor. It is my responsibility. And if this goes badly, what are we going to do? Are we going to try to get back across the Jordan? Are we going to go back to the wilderness? It's basically we succeed or we're all dead. That was the kind of uh, pressure, the kind of responsibility, the kinds of stakes that were facing Joshua. But in the words of those internet ads, you won't believe what happened next. Look uh, at the second half of verse 13, or, or the rest of verse 13. So when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. So he looks up, and there's this guy with a sword. And not just with a sword, but with a drawn sword. This was probably pretty alarming initially, for Joshua. Uh, He must have been thinking, where did this guy come from? How did he sneak up on me without me noticing? And why does he have a sword that's out, right? You don't normally walk, if you have a sword, you don't normally walk around with your sword drawn. If you draw your sword, it means you are ready to fight, right? You're expecting, uh, you're expecting to fight. So Joshua's probably thinking, am I going to have to fight this guy? You know, hopefully the commander of the armies of Israel doesn't get killed on the eve of this important battle. Maybe I should have brought some people with me. Um, But anyway, he asks a logical question. Are you on our side or are you on the side of our enemies? Uh, At the end of verse 13 there, are you for us or are you for our enemies? Well, the response is really interesting. This man, this figure says, neither. Some translations just say no. No. I'm not on the side of you or your enemies. So who are you then? Well, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And that's, that's the personal name of God there. But as commander of the army of Yahweh, I have now come. Wow. That should give you chills. It certainly gives me chills. That God you serve... I'm the commander of his army, and I have just showed up. I'm here. And I love Joshua's response, which is very appropriate. He falls face down to the ground in reverence. Some translations say he falls uh, face down to the ground in worship. And in effect says, tell me what to do. I'm listening. So who is this person? Who is this man with the drawn sword? Well, there's, there's two main options. Um, some interpreters think that this is an angel, an angel commander of God's angelic army. Uh, perhaps it's the archangel Michael, uh, who's mentioned in the book of Daniel as the, the angelic prince who protects the people of Israel. So that's, that's a possibility that this is an angel Michael or, or some other angel. Uh, and certainly there's other instances in the Bible where an angel appears Uh, to kind of represent the Lord and convey a message directly from the Lord, to convey the very words of the Lord. And so in that case, Joshua falling on his face in reverence here, it's an expression of his reverence for God and for the fact that this is a message from God. Uh, He certainly wouldn't be worshiping the angel who's just a messenger. So that's one possibility. The other possibility is that this is an Old Testament appearance of Jesus, of the pre-incarnate Uh, Christ. Um, There's a technical word for this, which is Christophany, which just means an appearance of Christ. And in that case, Joshua, although he wouldn't necessarily know who Jesus was, he's recognizing that he's in the presence of God, and he's he's falling down and worshiping 
uh, the second person of the Trinity here. Both of these interpretations are possible. We don't really know for sure which one it is. Um, and the Bible doesn't make it explicit for us. But in either case, we know that this person is armed and dangerous, has command of God's angelic army, speaks for God, can give Joshua orders, and effectively puts Joshua in God's presence uh, and makes the place where they are holy. Uh, a couple of verses later, or, or yeah, a couple of verses later, Joshua uh, actually t- has to take off his sandals because the place he's standing is holy. So Joshua's response is a very good one. He says, what message does my Lord have for his servant? And the first thing the commander says is to t- tell him to take off his sandals because the place he's standing is holy. And this is quite significant. It would have been significant to Joshua because there's another time in the Bible where somebody has an encounter where God speaks to them and says, take off your sandals because the place you are standing is holy. Does anybody know where that has already happened in the Bible? It happened to Moses and and where specifically? At the burning bush, that's right. So Josh and Joshua would know this from Moses. Just as God spoke to Moses and, and, uh, Moses was in his presence and had to take off his sandals. So now God is speaking to Joshua. Joshua is in God's presence. Joshua has to take off his sandals. So this is a way of God saying, yes, you are the successor to Moses. And just as I was with Moses, so I am with you, the successor. And then following that, uh, as we move into uh, chapter 6, the first five verses of chapter 6, the Lord has very specific instructions for Joshua, just as he had very specific instructions for Moses when he met with Moses. Uh, the first verse of chapter 6 just kind of reminds us of the context. Jericho is all shut up uh, because of the Israelites, and really what that means is they're ready for a siege. They're ready for the Israelites to lay siege to the city. And this, of course, is the problem that's facing Joshua. And so now God tells Joshua very specifically, here's what you need to do. And uh, We won't go through this in a lot of detail, but Notice, it's not conventional military tactics. This is not normally how you would attack a city. Instead, it's march around the city for six days with the ark. Uh, On the seventh day, march around it seven times. Have your seven priests below their trumpets. And then the the walls are going to come down and you're all going to go up into this uh, fortified city. And so God's plan, it's not about a display of military might of the Israelites. Because really, no military might is being displayed here. They're just marching and blowing trumpets. It's a display of the power of God to win battles for the Israelites. And uh, God says uh, in verse 2, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with its king and its fighting men. He's using the past tense. I have delivered Jericho into your hands. It's already as good as done. I've already determined uh, the outcome of this battle. And so what does Joshua do? Well, uh, let's look at verses 6 and 7. So Joshua, son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, take up the ark of the covenant of the Lord and have seven priests carry trumpets in front of it. And he ordered the people, advance, march around the city with the armed guard going ahead of the ark of the Lord. He follows the instructions. He gathers the priests He gets them ready and he says, advance. And the rest, of course, we know. It's not in the passage we're looking at today, but uh, the Israelites follow God's instructions. The city of Jericho falls uh, and uh, they're all uh, put to the sword except for the family of Rahab uh, who had sheltered the spies. Uh, I think probably most of us know that story. Okay, so that's what happens in the passage. Now, some of you perhaps may be thinking, Well, this all happened more than 3,000 years ago, as you uh, mentioned earlier. And let's be honest, I'm not planning to besiege any Canaanite cities anytime soon. So what's the point? Uh, And uh, if you are planning to besiege any Canaanite cities, please speak to me or one of the other deacons after the service. We probably have to have a word with you. But to give a more serious answer to that question, 2 Timothy 3.16, a passage many of you probably have memorized, reminds us that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And, and this passage from Joshua is no exception. So what does it have to teach us today? 
I'd like to briefly highlight two key principles that we can learn from this whole episode with Joshua. Two key principles. First principle is that God has his purposes. Our job is to get on board with what God is doing, not vice versa. Okay, I'll say that again. God has his purposes, and our job is to get on board with what God is doing, not vice versa. Joshua asks the man with the drawn sword, are you for us or are you for our enemies? It's a reasonable question, but it's the wrong question. The answer is neither. I'm not part of your army. The question is, are you part of my army? It changes the perspective right around. The question isn't whether God is on our side, it's whether we are on God's side. Who had promised Canaan to the Israelites? God. Who had brought them out of Egypt? God. Who had let them cross the Jordan on dry dry ground? God. This was God's plan. It was God's purpose. God already has his purposes that he's working out in the world. And what he sets out to do, he is going to accomplish. And so the question is, are we in line with what God is doing? Are we on the Lord's side, as that uh, great hymn goes? Now, this principle, I would say, guards us against kind of two opposite mistakes we can make. One is the mistake of pride, and the other is the mistake of, of despair. Okay, so the first mistake is the mistake of pride. And this principle guards us against pride because it's not ultimately about us, right? It's not ultimately about what we want to do or what we want to accomplish or, or what our purposes and our plans and our goals are. It's actually about what God is doing. If we simply make our own plans without reference to God, in the long run, it's not going to work. You can't come up with a plan for your church or your career or your marriage or your business or your life without reference to God's purposes for those things. And then try to recruit God to get on board with your plan. Really, that's a recipe for disaster. Uh, Psalm 127 verse 1 says, Unless the Lord builds the house... The builders labor in vain. Unless God is in the work, the work ultimately is futile. Now, God often spares us from the full consequences of this kind of foolish planning, right? Sometimes we do this and God doesn't allow things to go bad uh, too badly. But that still doesn't mean that it's a good idea. <clears throat> As someone once said, check yourself before you wreck yourself. No, instead, what God's purposes are Sorry, no, instead ask what God's purposes are for his people and then ask how you can get on board with those purposes. Join his team. And so the kinds of questions you should be asking are, what is God trying to accomplish for me, through me, for other people? Would this marriage be pleasing to God? Would it be wise to commit my time to greater involvement in this activity instead of this activity? Will this deal uphold godly principles of integrity and service in my business? Is this decision in line with the direction that God gives us in his word? When you can answer yes to those questions, that's when you can say that you are on board with what God is doing and when you can have confidence in being part of what God is doing. So that's the first thing that this passage warns against. It warns us against the pride that says, here's what I want to do and then I'll see if I can recruit God to get on side with that. It it turns things around and says, actually, find out what God is doing and get on board with that. Secondly, this passage uh, warns us against despair. That's the kind of the opposite mistake that we can make. And this is the, the feeling that we have when we're facing what seem like insurmountable obstacles. When the odds are stacked so high against us, we just want to give up. There's, we feel like there's no way that we can do anything. There's no way we can succeed. And as for us as a church, as Christians in Canada in the second decade of the 21st century, it's easy to look around and get discouraged. There's a lot of things we can be discouraged about. Our neighbors don't want to hear about God. Young people don't attend church. So many people in Parliament and the courts and at the CBC head offices and in the university faculty lounges seem to think biblical Christianity is ridiculous and backwards and out of date. The news industry and the tech industry and the executives at Google and Facebook and 
for that matter, an army of people, every time I look at my Facebook feed, seem to think biblical teaching, especially about sexuality, is terrible and stupid and hateful. In other words, the city has such thick walls. It's so well defended. What are we going to do? And it's very discouraging. What should we do? Should we give up? Of course not. God says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the very ends of the earth. That's God's plan. Some of you perhaps saw the movie Dunkirk in theaters lately. I saw it last week. Uh, It's quite good. Uh, At one point in the movie, a civilian is captaining a small boat, and he's going to the the beach of Dunkirk where there's all these stranded soldiers, and he's going to go back to rescue some of these soldiers and take them back to England. And along the way, uh, he sees a man, a soldier, uh, in the water, and he rescues him and brings him on the boat. And this soldier, who's come from Dunkirk, figures out, okay, this boat is going back to Dunkirk. And he tries to talk the captain out of it. He says, um, we can't go there. If we go there, we're going to die. And the captain replies, there's no hiding from this, son. We have a job to do, and we're going to do it. And I think that applies very much to us as well. Yes, we're in a difficult situation as a church in this part of the world at this time in history, although there's lots of other even more difficult situations that we could think of. But we have a job to do, and there's no hiding from it. And it is the job that God has for us to do. So it guards against despair as well as guarding against pride. So that was the first principle. What's the second principle uh, that we can draw from this passage? Principle number two is that the battle belongs to God, not to us. The battle belongs to God, not to us. And this point is directed towards those of us who sometimes feel, as Joshua may have been tempted to feel, that all of the weight of the responsibility is on our shoulders, that this all hangs on us. And you may feel this way if you're the person who's working hard to try to serve God even when it's an uphill battle. Maybe you're involved in a ministry at church, and it's just hard going. It's hard uh, to get volunteers. You've had some challenges. You've had some difficulties. And particularly those of us who, like Joshua, are in positions of leadership of some kind, really can feel that weight of responsibility. Uh, Whether it's leadership in a church setting, leadership at work, uh, leadership in your family, even informally leadership among a group of friends where people are looking to you to kind of set the tone for things. Whatever it is, you're the person who has to make the hard decisions and then has to convince people to follow you uh, along with those decisions. And so here there's always that temptation to feel anxious and to rely on your own strength and to lie awake at night uh, thinking those things over in your mind. And again, that's certainly a temptation that Joshua could have experienced on the eve of the conquest. But that's one of the reasons why his encounter with the commander of the army of the Lord is so powerful, because it reminds him the battle ultimately doesn't depend on him, but it depends on God. God says, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. And today, just as in the days of Joshua, God is at work in ways that we can't see. And as humans, we're so fixated on what we can see, that we forget, it's easy for us to forget, that there's an unseen spiritual battlefield all around us. Normally it's hidden from us, but sometimes we get glimpses of it. And in this case, Joshua has given a glimpse into this hidden realm, that the army of the Lord is present and the commander of the army of the Lord is there meeting with him. Just because he can't see them doesn't mean they aren't there. Now, this doesn't mean that God will guarantee the success of whatever we want to do. It's important to make this point. Um, If we're doing things that aren't in line with his will, there's certainly no guarantee that those things are going to succeed. In fact, more likely the opposite. But even sometimes when we're doing his will, God allows his will temporarily to be resisted for a time. Uh, And we see this lots of times in scripture as well. But when God's purposes are being served, we can trust God with the outcome. And of course, in the long run, God's purposes always succeed. Now, this also doesn't mean that we're supposed to sit on our hands. Joshua doesn't say, great, thanks, I'm going to go back to the camp and we're just going to kind of wait this out and God, you know, just take care of the city for us. 
No, of course not. God actually has very specific things for Jericho to do. He has a key role to play in God's plan, and he needs to carry out that role. And here, Joshua's behavior is a great example for us as well. He submits to the Lord's authority. He falls down in reverence. He listens to what the Lord has to say, and then he does it. He obeys the Lord's instructions. And so that that applies to us as well. Yes, the battle belongs to God, and we still have a role to play. Those things are both true. And so we need to submit to God, listen to his instructions, and then obey them. But we can move forward with the assurance that God is in control and that the battle belongs to him. Now, as I close, I want to draw your attention to our Alpha campaign this fall. Many of you have uh, already gotten involved in some way, uh, and an important announcement for you is that we are having a meeting after the service next week. Okay, so next Sunday, August 20th, there's a meeting after the service for everybody who's involved in Alpha in whatever capacity. So please remember that. Uh, And we're doing a big thing here with this campaign. As a church, we're stepping forward in faith to bring the gospel to our friends and neighbors. And this can be a little bit intimidating. Perhaps you're not intimidated yet, but probably there's going to be a point where you're a little bit intimidated. We don't know whether the people we invite are going to come. We don't know how many people are going to show up. Uh, We don't know how they're going to react to the conversations that we have, to the videos. Uh, And there's a lot of work to do to make all of these things happen. But I think this passage that we looked at this morning is the perfect reminder as we move into this Alpha campaign. We are moving into the promised land. We're moving forward in accordance with God's purposes. We know God wants us to do this. If we know anything from the Bible, we know God wants us to do this. And so we know we're on board with God's purposes. And yes, we have a very specific job to do, but we can trust God for the outcome and remind ourselves that the battle belongs to him. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Lord God, we thank you for your word to us. We thank you, Lord, that uh, it was written uh, so many years ago under the inspiration of your Holy Spirit so that it could instruct your people. We thank you, Lord, that you're a God who shows up. We thank you that you've promised to be with us until the end of the age. We thank you that the battle doesn't belong to us, but that it belongs to you. And so, Lord, we ask that as we uh, prepare to share the gospel with our neighbors through the Alpha Campaign, that your Holy Spirit would be at work in our hearts, that you would encourage us, that you would strengthen us through faith, and uh, that you would make us strong and courageous, just as you made Joshua strong and courageous. And we pray all these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.